going to talk about the reciprocal lattice and diffraction. And on the basis of the reciprocal lattice, you ought to be able to understand why we define the Miller indices of planes as we do. That means we take the intercept, and then we take the reciprocal of the intercept. And we'll also be able to prove the weiss zone law very, very easily. OK, so I'll begin by introducing uh, vectors, just some very simple terms about vectors. So a vector is basically a quantity which has a magnitude and a direction. And in order to refer to the vector, we need a reference set of coordinates, right? And in this case, the reference set of coordinates is a1, a2, and a3. Uh, these are basically three vectors which are not coplanar. OK, so they can be of arbitrary length and making arbitrary angles, but they are not coplanar. If they are of equal size and at 90 degrees to each other, then we say this is an orthogonal set of vectors. Okay? If they have unit magnitude and are at 90 degrees to each other, we say it's an orthonormal set of coordinates. But whatever this is, if we take the components of u along a1, a2, and a3, uh, then we will get u1, u2, and u3. So the vector u is written in terms of the basis vectors a1, a2, and a3. And normally, when we write the direction, we simply write it as the components of the vector. Okay? The, the reference uh, set of coordinates are not mentioned, but this refers specifically to this basis vectors a. Directions are usually written as column vectors, okay, a single column vector, but that can be inconvenient to write, so we often write this with square brackets. But a direction is usually written as a column vector. So basically, a vector has a direction and it has a magnitude here. And I'll write the vector by underlining it or by using a bold letter. And the magnitude is just a, a letter by itself. A dot product between two vectors is simply uh, taking the resolution of this vector along another vector. Now imagine that v here, v hat, is a unit vector. Okay? Then when I project the vector u along v hat, I get u cos theta. So this basically, this distance here is the projection of u along the direction v. Okay? So when I take a dot product, it's the magnitude of u times the magnitude of v multiplied by the cos of the angle between the two vectors. But the physical meaning of the dot product is that I'm taking the projection of u along v hat. Yeah? You can see this is the projection of u along this direction. Is that clear? OK. So that's the dot product. Also called the scalar product. Yeah. The cross product is a little bit more complicated because it actually leads to a vector. So imagine that I'm taking a1 cross a2. Then that is equal to the magnitude of a1 times the magnitude of a2 times the sine of the angle between them. And this scalar quantity is multiplied by a unit vector, which is at 90 degrees to a1 and a2. And the order in which we do this is important. So for example, here I've written a1 cross a2. So I start with a1 cross a2. So a3 should point downwards. Yeah? It's, it's a right-handed product. So you've got a1, a2, a1 cross a2, and a3 hat here a unit vector, is pointing downwards. If I had taken A2 cross A1, it would point upwards, right? Now, what is the physical meaning of, of this scalar quantity A1, A2 sine theta? Well, A1, A2 sine theta is simply the area enclosed by this plane. Okay? So if I draw that... This is a1, a2, and this is theta. Now, what I want is the height of this 
parallelogram to work out the area because base times height gives me the area, right? And the height is this distance, which is a1 sine theta. Yeah. So a1 sine theta times a2 simply gives me the area of this plane. So that's important to remember. And the vector a3 hat points at 90 degrees to the plane. So we identify the orientation of a plane by a vector which is normal to that plane. So a3 hat is pointing at 90 degrees to this plane, and that tells us the orientation of that plane. The area of the plane is a1, a2 sine theta. Everybody happy with that? So that's an elementary revision of uh, vectors, dot products, and cross products. And again, this is just a simple illustration that A2 cross A3 will give me a vector along here. And this is the area of the plane, which is A2, A3 sine of the angle between the two. Now, in this diagram, if I write A1 cross A2 dot A3, what does that give me? Hmm? Okay, first of all, um, will this be a vector or a scalar? It will be a scalar because we end up with a dot product. But which operation would you do first? The cross product, okay? So A1 cross A2, uh, or let me write this differently. A2 cross A3 dot A1, okay? So A2 cross A3 is what on this diagram? The area of the surface with the That's right, it's the area of this base, right? And that will give me a vector which is parallel to what? When I take A2 cross A3, where can I identify the resultant vector? Yeah? Uh, vertically upwards, it will be along here, right? And the unit vector along here, if we take the magnitude to be the area. What then is A1 dot a unit vector along here? It's the projection of A1 along the vertical direction. In other words, the height of this, right? Therefore, A2 cross A3 dot A1 gives me the volume of this cell, right? Is everybody happy with that? We have the area here. That results in a unit vector here when we take a cross product between A2 and A3. And we then want to work out the height. So A1 dot that unit vector will simply give me the projection of A1 along the vertical, which is the height of this. Area times height gives me the volume. Okay. So A2 cross A3 dot A1 is the volume of the cell. A1 cross A2 dot A3 is exactly the same, and so on. Now I'm going to define uh, a really strange concept if it's the first time that you've come across it. Just like we've got the real basis, that means the set of vectors A1, A2, and A3. We can identify this, this set of basis vectors with a basis symbol. Just like, you know, if you're referring to ferrite, you say it's alpha. Or if you're referring to the crystallographic axis of austenite, you say gamma. Just like that, when we want to write a vector with reference to this basis, u1, u2, u3, you want to specify, you know, what basis you are referring it to, then you simply put the basis symbol at the bottom, okay? What I want to do now is to define another strange basis, which is called the reciprocal basis, which is related to A. Okay. So the reciprocal basis, which we conventionally label with a star. So it's the reciprocal basis A star, whose basis vectors will be A1 star, A2 star, 
and A3 star. And just like this, a vector in the reciprocal basis uh, will be H1, H2, H3 referred to the reciprocal basis. Now notice that I've deliberately used round vectors, uh, round brackets. Okay? What does that imply? Make it plain. Yeah. So a vector in the reciprocal basis refers to a plane normal. Okay? We will demonstrate that shortly. Uh, and a vector in the real basis refers to a direction. And the magnitude of the vector in the reciprocal basis is 1 upon the spacing of the planes. Okay? So the vector is normal to a set of planes and its magnitude is 1 upon the spacing of those planes. So let's, let's just prove that. Okay? So in all these equations, you, you have already learned that this is the volume of the cell, right? Now this is the area enclosed by A2 and A3. Yeah, you've got two vectors and the area. Area divided by volume gives me 1 upon a length, right? And in this case, the plane we are referring to is at 90 degrees to A2 and A3. So which plane would this be? In terms of indices, which plane is it? 1, zero, 0, because A2 and A3, yeah? A2 is uh, along the y-axis, if you like, and A3 is along the z-axis. So this refers to the 1, zero, 0, plane. And the area of the 1, zero, 0, plane divided by the volume of the cell is the spacing of the 1, zero, 0, plane. And this vector is at 90 degrees to the 1, zero, 0, plane. Okay? So... I'm going to leave this on the board. So A2 cross A3, and if I, if I divide it by the magnitude of A2 times the magnitude of A3 is a vector normal to the 1, 0, 0 planes. Okay? And this quantity divided by this quantity is the spacing of the 1, 0, 0 planes. So A2 cross A3 divided by the volume of the cell is equal to 1 upon the spacing of the 1, 0, 0 planes. We'll discover that this reciprocal nature of this vector is very useful because in diffraction theory, we often come up with terms which are 1 upon length. We'll, we'll come to that shortly. Okay. So is everybody clear about the reciprocal basis? So you can imagine this to be a strange kind of a coordinate transformation. So we've, we have the basis A and we have the basis A star and this simply represents a coordinate transformation between A and A star. Okay. So this is illustrating that uh, product again. A2 cross A3, A2 cross A3 gives me a vector which is along here, okay? And the area of this plane is A2 times A3 times sine of the angle between these two. Then take the dot product along here to get the height, which will give me the uh, spacing of the planes, okay? So that's how we define the reciprocal lattice. So for every lattice, there's also a reciprocal lattice, and vectors in the reciprocal lattice correspond to normals to planes and have a magnitude which is 1 upon the spacing of those planes. So let me now ask you what A1 dot A1 star is. What do you get when you take a dot product between A1 and A1 star? A1 star is written over here. Yeah, why, why is that? Because they are analog. 
Yeah. Well, you know, you know, if I, if I, uh, they are not parallel. A1 and A1 star are not necessarily parallel. Because A1 star is normal to a plane, whereas A1 is an axis. And in a cube, you may be correct. But in anything else, the normal will not be parallel to the direction. Yeah? So how do we know that A1 dot A1 star is 1? Uh, your answer is correct. Approximately yeah, if I if I take a one dot a one star, then I will have a one dot a two cross a three, which is the volume divided by the volume, right? So a one dot a one star will be one. Is everybody happy with that? Yeah, the top and the bottom become the volume of the cell, so that's one volume divided by volume, so that's one. How about a1, uh, or let's make it A2 dot A1 star. So again, we've got A1 star over here, so you can take a dot product. Yeah, why is that? Yeah, because this cross product gives us a vector which is at 90 degrees to both of these. Yeah, so it'll be along here. Then clearly, A2 dot a2 cross A3 must be 0. Yeah? So in general, you know, when whatever I is, yeah, from 1 to 3, and I and J, when I does not equal to J. Okay? Right, so let's now uh, prove the Weiss zone rule. Okay, so we have a direction UVW. Right, that's my direction UVW. I've written it as a vector in real space. And I have a plane normal, H. Now it's a vector in reciprocal space. Yeah. Okay. So what I want to do now is take U dot H. Yeah? Right, so to take the dot product, I will have u a1 dot h a1 star, u a1 dot k a2 star, u1 a1 dot l a3 star, and so on. Yeah? So when I multiply this by this, what do I get when I take the dot product here? u h, right? What about u a1 times k a2 star? Zero. And similarly, this will be zero. So we end up with uh, v k plus w l, right? Now, if, if u and h are at 90 degrees to each other, then this must be zero. Yeah, because the dot product of two vectors at 90 degrees is zero. And that's the proof for the Weiss zone rule. Now notice that I have made no assumptions about the nature of the basis A. In other words, the vectors A1, A2, and A3 can be at any angle to each other as long as they are not coplanar and of any magnitude. So this applies to any crystal system. That if, if a direction lies in a plane, in other words, these two vectors are at 90 degrees to each other, then the Weiss zone rule will be satisfied. OK? So with the reciprocal basis, it's very, very simple to prove things like this as a general rule. OK? Is everybody happy with that? OK. Now, this is just to emphasize what I was saying earlier, that this is completely general, what we were doing. 
And here is uh, an oblique cell where you know, we've got A1 going along here. And uh, sorry, this is the oblique cell here. So A1, no, this is the cell. A1 is along here, A2 is along here. But notice that A2 star points here because it's at 90 degrees to these planes. So A2 star and A2 are not parallel. And similarly, A1 star is at 90 degrees to this. And therefore, A1 star is not parallel uh, to A1. Yeah. In the cubic system, it's correct that A1 will be parallel to A1 star, but not in any other system in general. So the reciprocal lattice cell, in this case, is oriented like this. Yeah. Can you see that? And notice also that the magnitude of the vector here scales as 1 upon the spacing of the planes. So here, if you like, the spacing of the planes is large. Yeah? Therefore, this vector is small. The spacing here is small, and therefore, this vector is large. So the magnitude of the reciprocal lattice vector scales with 1 upon the spacing. Okay, this is just repeating what I've just said, that a reciprocal lattice vector is normal to a plane and has magnitude 1 upon the spacing, where d is the spacing of those planes. Throughout these lectures that follow, you will see enormous use for the reciprocal lattice, but what I'm going to do today is uh, show you how diffraction comes into, um, how the reciprocal lattice is useful in dealing with diffraction. OK, this we've already done. Now, here we have uh, our nice cubic stereogram with 1, 0, 0 along here, 0, 1, 0, and 0, 0, 1 pointing out of the plane of the board. And I'd like to draw a diffraction, uh, a section of the reciprocal lattice, not a diffraction pattern, but a section of the reciprocal lattice which is uh, at 90 degrees to the 0, 0, 001 direction. So that means that on that section, all these planes will appear because they are all at 90 degrees to 0, 0, 001, right? So I want to draw a section of the reciprocal lattice. normal to 0, 0, 001. Okay. Well, I can pick from any of those on the red circle, right? All those poles will be at 90 degrees to 0, 0, 001. So to make life easier, I'll pick the, the a 0, 1, 0. Okay. So I've got my origin of the reciprocal lattice and I'm plotting uh, 0, 1, 0 along here, and therefore I will have 0 bar 1, 0 here. What should I plot next? Yeah, I mean, you know, you could actually pick any anything, yeah? But it makes, it's easier if we pick one at 90 degrees. So here we have, um, 1, 0, 0, and bar 1, 0, 0. Okay. Now, do I need to look at the stereogram to complete this? Because once you have two vectors, everything else is solved. So, for example, here we have this plus this, which is bar 1, 1, 0, and you can see bar 1, 1, 0 there. And similarly, you'll have a spot here and here, and you can carry on doing this, yeah? Notice also that the symmetry of this pattern is consistent with the fact that 0, 0, 001 is a tetrad. This is not a diffraction pattern. We've just drawn the reciprocal lattice section normal to 0, 0, 001. 
And if I wanted to draw a, a pattern with the zone, uh, a section normal to 0 bar 1, 1, then I, I could pick two poles on this because everything on here is at 90 degrees to this, right? So here is the section of the reciprocal lattice which we've just drawn on the board. And um, we've assumed this is a primitive cubic lattice. Now we want to draw a section which is normal to 1 bar 1, 0. So what will be the symmetry of this pattern? So it will be at the zone axis, if you like, is 1, 1, 0. What will be the symmetry of the pattern that we get of the reciprocal lattice section normal to 1, 1, 0? What's the symmetry of the 1, 1, 0 axis? Diet, OK? So we expect it to be a diet. And we can pick any, any pole along here. Which one would you like me to pick? So I'll draw the origin in, OK? Let's pick a difficult one, like 1 bar 1, 1, OK? So I'll put 1 bar 1, 1 along here. And opposite, I get bar 1, 1, bar 1. So if I now go a distance of, I think this is um, 57 degrees or so, okay. then I should get a point here, which is 0, 0, 1, and 0, 0, bar 1, here. Yeah? And there will be another point here, which is this minus this, or this plus this, which is um, 1 bar 1, 2. OK? Now, 1 bar 1, 2 doesn't appear on this diagram, but that's, that's correct, as we've written. And similarly, on the other side, we will get the opposite of that. OK? Everyone happy with that? Now, we, we can carry on plotting these uh, patterns. Uh, th this is now the 1, 1, 1 zone, which will have a symmetry, which is a triad. Okay? So you can see that this is the same as this, as this, as this. They're all of the same form, and it will be a hexagonal pattern because 1 on 1 is a triad. So there's our reciprocal lattice section normal to the 1 on 1 plane. OK? Now, this is just the reciprocal lattice section. But have you heard of uh, systematic absences? Have you ever heard in diffraction theory of systematic absences? Okay, so we are now going to deal with some diffraction theory that basically, you know, even though we have this reciprocal lattice section, at some points on that reciprocal lattice, there will be no intensity in diffraction, okay, because all the waves scatter out of phase. Yeah, so we'll do that next. Right, so we'll derive uh, the Bragg equation first. So this is a set of planes, which is diffracting. And you know the planes actually continue to infinity in the horizontal direction, yeah? because the Bragg law applies to an infinitely sized crystal. And I'll explain to you why that is the case. Uh, so imagine that we are illuminating this with x-rays, uh, with a wavelength lambda. Then this particular beam is coming from, is being reflected by this plane here, right? And similarly, this, this one is also being reflected by this plane. Is there any difference in path between those two planes in the length of the path? Okay. 
So is there any difference in the length of the path between the two red beams? Yeah. So in going from point A to point D, is the path length here different in going, uh, sorry, in going from point A to point B, do we have a different distance in going from point C to point D? We don't, right? That means the two scattered waves are exactly in phase with each other. Yes? The meaning of being in phase is that if this is our electromagnetic wave, then these two are exactly in phase. Yeah? That means they reinforce each other. On the other hand, if I, if I look at this beam here, which is coming from deeper inside the crystal, then I have a path difference which is equal to this plus this here. So PO plus OQ compared with this beam. Yeah, you can see. Yeah, so if I, if I look at the path difference between this and this, then I have this extra distance that this ray which is going, coming, being reflected from deeper inside the crystal has to tolerate. So PO plus OQ is the path difference. And if this path difference is equal to a wavelength, then it will still reinforce. Okay, but if it's half a wavelength, then it will cancel out the diffraction. Now, what is that distance PO plus OQ? Well, uh, this is uh, the angle at which the beam is hitting the surface, theta. And if I take the sine of theta, then that's uh, PO divided by this, right? And this is the spacing of the plane. So, sine of theta is equal to PO divided by D. So PO is equal to D sine theta. And just from symmetry, OQ is also equal to D sine theta. So when 2D sine theta is equal to lambda, we get reinforcement. Lambda is the wavelength. And of course, it need not be just one wavelength out of phase. It can be two wavelengths out of phase or three wavelengths. So we have this integer n here. So that's, that's basically the Bragg equation, okay? which defines uh, everything about uh, diffraction. But note that it is for a crystal which is of infinite size, because if I deviate slightly from the Bragg angle, theta, I'm able to find somewhere deep inside the crystal another wave which is exactly half a wavelength out of phase. And that's why we only get diffraction at the exact Bragg angle. But as you make your crystal thinner and thinner, it's not possible to find another wave which will be exactly half a wavelength out of phase because the crystal doesn't exist at a depth. And then you may get diffracted intensity even when you deviate from theta, right? Now, can you tell me, um, when you do your diffraction experiments, yeah? Um, do you do them in the electron microscope or on x-rays? What is the maximum dimension that you're dealing with in an electron microscope? When you do electron diffraction, what is the size of your crystal? Yeah, it's of the order of a thousand angstroms, yeah? The thickness of a thin foil. That's not infinite, okay? When you do x-ray diffraction, what is the size of your crystal? What is the penetration distance? A few micrometers, yeah? Again, that's not infinite. And that's why when you see the spots, 
in your electron diffraction pattern, they're not you know, infinitely thin spots. They're actually quite broad spots, right? And many people who do X-ray diffraction on small particles, you know, nanoparticles, yeah, you can't actually get sharp peaks of X-rays because they're tiny crystals. You need to have an infinitely sized crystal to only get diffraction at the exact theta. Okay? Now, we are going to uh, express the Bragg law using vectors in reciprocal space. Right? So now, um, the wavelength is written as a vector k whose magnitude is 1 upon lambda. Right? So the magnitude of k is 1 upon lambda. 1 upon lambda. And k refers to the incident beam and k dashed refers to the diffracted beam. And we are considering elastic scattering. Okay? So what does that mean about the magnitude of k dashed? It must also be lambda. In other words, we are not losing any energy when we reflect the beam. Okay? So k and k dash both have a magnitude lambda. And if you, if you go back to our diagram for diffraction, the angle between the incident beam and the diffracted beam, yeah, incident beam and diffracted beam, is 2 theta. Right? So always the angle between the incident beam and the diffracted beam is 2 theta. So when I do this construction, the angle here is 2 theta between k and k dashed. Yeah, is everybody happy with that? Now, this is, this is a reciprocal lattice vector G, starting from the origin of the reciprocal lattice. So this sphere is drawn so that it touches the origin uh, along the incident beam. Yeah, can you see that? This is the origin of the reciprocal lattice, the sections that we drew earlier. This is the direction of the incident beam, and this is a vector representing the normal to a certain set of planes and its magnitude is 1 upon the spacing of those planes. Now, if these three vectors touch each other, yeah, then we have satisfied the Bragg equation because, look, uh, k dashed minus k all right, is equal to the vector g. Can you see that? k dashed minus k will give me a vector parallel to g, right? Now, sine of theta here, if I, if I draw a vertical line here, sine of theta is simply half this distance yeah, divided by the hypotenuse, so it's half g divided by k, right? And k we know is 1 upon lambda, and g we know is um, 1 upon d. So if you, if you rearrange this, that's exactly the Bragg equation. So this is the vector form of the Bragg equation, that the Bragg equation is satisfied if k dash minus k is exactly equal to a reciprocal lattice vector. Yeah, does that make sense? So I've now uh, drawn out the reciprocal lattice uh, more than just the origin. So again, this is the origin, this is the direction of the incident beam, and you know, we have all these reciprocal lattice points, just like we did the construction using the stereogram. And this particular point, reciprocal lattice vector here, lies exactly on this sphere. And therefore, it satisfies the Bragg equation. And the diameter of the sphere is one upon lam uh, 2 upon lambda, yeah, because the radius is 1 upon lambda. So if I do this construction, then everywhere the sphere touches a reciprocal lattice point, I will satisfy the Bragg equation. So in this case, I will get a reflection from the 1, 0, 1 planes. Okay? I will not get reflection from 1, 0, 0 or from 2, 0, 0 if my incident beam is along the 1, 0, 0 direction. Yeah? I will get diffraction from this one but not from this or this. 
So if I superimpose the sphere on the reciprocal lattice, I can determine which of those planes will give me diffraction. Okay. Now supposing I'm not using a unique wavelength. That means uh, you know I've got a spread of wavelengths. For example, when you're doing a Lowy diffraction, you use white X-rays. Yeah. Then in addition to this sphere, I might have another sphere giving me the uh, minimum wavelength that I'm using. And any, any reciprocal lattice point which lies between those two spheres will then give me diffraction. Okay? If I rotate my crystal, then I simply rotate the reciprocal lattice about whatever axis you're rotating by. And every time one of those points intersects the sphere, I will get diffraction. Okay, so that's why sometimes, you know, when you're doing diffraction, you rotate the crystal, right? So using this construction, you can actually approach any kind of diffraction problem. Okay, now, now we need to think about the intensities of diffracted beams, okay? So earlier on, we constructed the reciprocal lattice section for the primitive cell. Uh, we had O, 1 O, etc. And all of these would give you a finite intensity when you shine X-rays or electrons onto it. But if we look at the cubic P, uh, sorry, cubic F here, where we have, you know, lattice points at half, half, half as well, I will not get a 1, 0, 0 reflection because X-rays bouncing off the 1, 0, 0 planes will be exactly half a wavelength out of phase with those coming from the 2, 0, 0 planes. So 1, 0, 0 is a missing reflection. On the other hand, 2, 0, 0 planes are possible. Okay? So when dealing with austenite, you will not get 1, 0, 0 reflections. They are missing reflections. There's zero intensity because you have planes of lattice points halfway which diffract exactly half a wavelength out of phase. Yeah. Similarly, can you see that this is the 110 plane? Yeah? And the spacing of the 110 plane is given by that, that line and that line. Yeah? But halfway between that, I have another set of planes, yeah? which is the 220 planes. Therefore, I do not get any 110 reflection in cubic F. Yeah. So do you see that we need not get all possible reciprocal lattice points contributing intensity to the diffraction pattern? Yeah. Is everybody happy with that? <coughs> that look. So this is my uh, cubic F. So if I'm looking at the one one zero planes, then the spacing of the one one zero planes is that, yeah. But in between, I've got the two two zero planes, which scatter exactly half a wavelength out of phase because the spacing is half of one one zero. And therefore, I will not get any diffraction from the 110 planes, which are missing reflections here. So these are called systematic absences. Okay? Similarly, if you look at this and compare cubic F and cubic P along uh, another zone axis, then even the shape of the pattern is completely different because we no longer have the 0, 0, 001 reflection, okay? and we no longer have the 110. You'd have to go out here to get the 220. So this looks like uh, a distorted hexagon, whereas this looks like a rectangle. But the reciprocal lattice for both of these would be the same. It's just that some reciprocal lattice points will not contribute to intensity. Okay? So the 110 pattern for cubic P would look completely different from that of cubic F because we would not get any 110 reflection. We would have to go to 220. And similarly, we don't get the 001 reflection. We have to go to 002.
And here's a, a, another example where we are looking at the 1, 1, 1 zone axis. Okay? So this is for cubic P, it's exactly hexagonal. For cubic F, it's also exactly hexagonal, but the spacing is different. Yeah? This would be a larger distance from the origin because the spacing of 2, 2, 0 planes is smaller than the spacing of 1, 1, 0 planes. Is everybody happy with that? Now, this is very nice. Uh, we can just tell by looking at the cell whether you will get diffraction or not. But if I asked you, you know, what about the 1, 3, 5 plane? Should I get intensity from the 1, 3, 5 plane? That's a bit tricky to draw a diagram, right? So we need an equation to determine whether we will get intensity or not. And the way we derive this equation is we look at scattering from individual atoms. But of course, the atoms are located on a lattice. So there's a certain pattern that we have to impose on the scattered intensity. Add up all the waves from the different locations and see whether they reinforce or whether they uh, cancel. So here, here is uh, the amplitude of the scattered beam. F here represents the atomic scattering factor. Okay, so just focus on this equation at the moment. Forget about all this. F refers to the scattering power of an individual atom. So whether if it's ion, then there's a function defined on how the ion scatters as a function of theta. If it's nickel, then it will be a different function. And if it's silicon, it will be yet another function. Okay? So these data are available uh, in textbooks or databases. Very, very simple. Okay? So this is the scattering power of an individual atom. And we have n atoms inside our unit cell. And these are the uh, planes that we are looking at, the 1, 3, 5 plane, say. Okay? And U, V, and W are the coordinates of the atom inside the unit cell. Yeah. So if it's, uh, if it's a primitive cubic, then it's at 0, 0, 0. Okay. U, V, W is 0, 0, 0. Yeah. And if it's a body-centered cubic, then you will also have half, half, half. Yeah. So we have to do the summation over all the atoms which are present in the unit cell. When you do this, you, you get the exact answer of whether you will get diffracted intensity from the 135 plane or not. Uh, this here is simply the square root of minus 1. Okay? It represents the square root of minus 1. And to make life uh, simple, whenever pi times i is odd, that means you have 1 pi or 3 pi or 5 pi, uh, the exponential becomes minus 1. And whenever it's an even number, it's plus 1. So there's no complicated mathematics involved here. Yeah? And this is the amplitude, and the intensity is actually the square of the amplitude. Okay? So if you get a minus number with this equation, it doesn't ma mean we have minus intensity. You simply have to square that to get intensity. Okay? Is everybody clear about that? Okay, so let's do the calculation for this cubic F cell where we have atoms located at 0, 0, 0, half, half, 0, half, 0, half, and 0, half, half. There are four atoms in the unit cell, right? And these are the face centering atoms. And this is the um, atom at the uh, origin. Yeah. So these are the coordinates. In other words, the U, V, W. And supposing I substitute in here the 1, 0, 0 plane, right? So h is 1, k is 0, and l is 0. Then this term automatically becomes e to the 0. Yeah? What is e to the 0? What? Yeah. Any, any exponential to the power of 0 is 1. So this term becomes 1. Uh, this is e to the pi i, because we've got h equals 1 and l equals 0. So what is e to the pi i equal to? Minus 1. And similarly, this one is minus 1. So we have plus 1, minus 1, minus 1, plus 1, which is 0. So we do not get any intensity from the 1, 0, 0 planes. Yeah? 
So this looks like a complicated equation, but actually it's very, very simple. And we have four terms here because we have um, four atoms in the cell. Everyone happy with that? So that is called a structure factor calculation. So we are, we are looking for which planes will give us scattered intensity and which will not. OK? Now, I, I said to you that in a transmission electron microscope, you're actually looking at a very, very thin specimen. You know, typically, it's less than 1,000 angstroms thick. So it's certainly not uh, an infinite crystal. And that means that you will get diffraction even though you're not exactly at the Bragg condition. Right? Now, the way that we represent that on our construction of the sphere in the reciprocal lattice, and incidentally, this is called the Avald sphere. You know, the k dashed minus k equals g construction is called the Avald sphere construction. Whoops. So the way that we represent the fact that our crystal is thin in one direction is instead of having reciprocal lattice points, we extend them in a direction normal to the thin direction, uh, normal to the thin foil. Yeah? So here, you see, instead of points, I've got these spikes, which are normal to the thin foil, to take account of the fact that I will get diffraction, even though I'm not at the Bragg condition. So for example, you can see that this if this was just a point, there's no way that the sphere would intersect that point, right? But it's not. It's, it's extended in reciprocal space because of the thickness of the crystal. As I make the crystal thick, this becomes a point. Okay? So I get diffraction from here and here, even though they are not exactly at the Bragg condition. So electron diffraction is very easy. X-ray is a bit more difficult because you're dealing with bulkier samples. Yeah, so you have to set the crystal exactly at Bragg to get the diffraction. Okay? What it also means, and this is very important, is that electron diffraction is inaccurate. Yeah, because you know, even though your zone axis is not exactly right, you will get diffraction. Yeah? I, I, I can tilt this sphere quite a lot and still get diffraction from these spots. That means it's not an accurate method. Okay, So bear that in mind when you do your analysis. Uh, this is one section of the reciprocal lattice. And if you, if you make your beam uh, convergent in the electron microscope, then you might also pick up information from the next layer. And that's why you see, you see the pattern in the middle, and you've got this ring over here. Now that's very useful, because you're getting three-dimensional information on diffraction. Yeah. Sometimes by just looking at one section of the reciprocal lattice, you can't solve the crystal structure because it might be ambiguous. You know, for, for example, the uh, 111 zone axis was exactly identical in geometry to, for the cubic P and cubic F lattices. So you couldn't decide just by looking at that whether you've got cubic P and cubic F unless you knew the lattice parameters and so forth. But if you had another layer, on top, then you would have three-dimensional information and you could much better solve the pattern. So here we are looking at two sections of the reciprocal lattice weighted for intensity, yeah, here and here. So that's by making the beam convergent. And this is just to illustrate what happens when you change the thickness of your foil is that this is with a 100 nanometer thick foil, so that is quite thick. Uh, and of course, you can't make it too thick, otherwise you don't get transparency. Yeah? And by making it thin, I'm picking up additional diffracted spots, because by making it thin, I extend those spikes in the Eval sphere construction. Right? You know, if I make these these uh, spikes even longer, then, for example, this one will start to intersect. Yeah? So by, by making your sample thinner, you are able to get more diffracted spots. But you lose accuracy as well. Uh, 
Um, and this is to show you the problem uh, of uh, accuracy, is that you know, I don't have to be exactly at 111 to pick up this pattern. Yeah? This is a deviation from 111. And typically, you know, the zone axis can be five degrees away, and you'll still get a diffraction pattern. And in X-ray diffraction, this is a, a crystal which is one micrometer thick, and this is three nanometers. And you can see how you broaden the intensity. You know, we are getting diffraction away from the exact theta because we've made the crystal very, very small. Okay. So be careful in your analysis of these patterns that as we get away from an infinite crystal, you will get diffracted intensity even away from the Bragg condition. Okay. I mean, three nanometers is ridiculously small. Yeah. You know, if you think about one gram of iron containing about 10 to the power of 23 atoms, you know, this, this is less than a particle of dust. Yeah. OK, I think that's the last. OK, well, one more thing. Uh, so with electron and X-ray diffraction, the electromagnetic waves are interacting with the electronic structure of the atom. Yeah. And that interaction becomes less and less intense as theta increases. Okay. And of course, the scattering power of an atom then varies with the atomic number because that determines how many electrons you have. Uh, in neutron diffraction, the neutrons are actually interacting with the nuclei. And they are not charged, uh, the neutrons are not charged particles, so they ignore the electrons. What that means is that you can pick up differences even between isotopes. Okay, so if you have uh, an iron isotope of 56 and 57, X-ray and electron diffraction will show no difference. Yeah, but neutrons, the scattering power is completely different for 56 and 57. And furthermore, the penetration distance of neutrons is centimeters. Okay, as opposed to micrometers. So what you can do then is take a whole chunk of material. So this is a, a sample of steel which is 20 millimeters thick. And by neutron diffraction, you can characterize the stress distribution in that sample because the strains on the lattice planes give you a measure of stress and do experiments like this. The only disadvantage is, of course, you need a reactor to generate the neutrons. Yeah? But there are national facilities in many places to do that. So if you want to look at you know, several centimeters thick material to characterize some information like residual stresses, it's best to do it with neutrons. OK? Any questions? OK. Now, uh, for, for next week, uh, we, we still have some uh, basic information to cover. But next week, I'll begin also on mathematical crystallography. So can you print out uh, the book, Geometry of Crystals, which is also on the website? Does everybody know about that? Yeah. OK.